uh, good morning everyone we will be presenting uh, about the primary angle closure glaucoma it's a huge burden of blindness so mostly when the patient come to us uh, they have already gone 80 to 90 percent of optic ne neuronal loss have been occurred in the patients so uh, its importance lies in the in its early detection and screening because when we treat early we can prevent the blindness so uh, I invite Dr. Divya. She will discuss the uh, pathogenesis and clinical features. And Dr. Ankita will cover the management part. I will be sharing my experience with the uh, patients of acute primary angle closure. We have uh, done primary phaco emulsification in these patients rather than laser peripheral iodotomy at the last. Thank you so much. A large proportion of glaucoma remains undiagnosed. And it is to our surprise that 50% of those with glaucoma do not even know that they have it. As it has already been told that it is a potentially blinding but treatable condition, hence the need for better screening strategies to identify such patients with glaucoma. Now, it is all around us. With underestimated prevalence, frequently misdiagnosed and mistreated, it is difficult to understand pathogenesis. There is an unpredictable course of disease and outcome. There are few controversies in the treatment and it is a frequent cause of glaucoma-related blindness. Coming to the burden, substantial bilateral blindness from glaucoma is observed in developing countries like ours with poor access to eye care. This can be reduced by early screening and therapy. It is found that it is the second most common cause of blindness worldwide and in Asian region, it is much more common. Especially in India, more than 11 million people are affected by glaucoma out of which more than 6 million people are diagnosed with primary open angle glaucoma and more than 2 million people with primary angle closure glaucoma. More than 27 million people are affected by any form of primary angle closure disease and to our surprise, approximately half of the adult patients have glaucoma. Now, with growth and aging of population, it may significantly increase on these numbers. Because it is a major cause of world glaucoma blindness, of these 60 million people affected with glaucoma worldwide, more than one-third have PACG. Now, comparing PACG with primary open-angle glaucoma, PACG is two times more blinding, but it is more treatable. In our situation, the National Program for Control of Blindness and Visual Impairment describes blindness as best-corrected visual acuity of less than 3 by 60 in better eye. Now, IOP is not the criteria to define glaucoma. Glaucoma is defined basis on the basis of whether the angle, iridocorneal angle is open or closed. In this diagram, we show the iridocorneal angle, which is the angle between the cornea and iris interface, which contains the Slems canal and the trabecular meshwork, which is the main pathway for drainage of the aqueous humor. This figure shows the iridocorneal angle with the Slems canal. The aqueous humor pathway follows synthesis from the ciliary body, as we already know. It goes into the posterior chamber. From the posterior chamber, it comes down to the anterior chamber via the pupillary orifice. And from the anterior chamber into the Schlem's canal and episcleral veins via the trabecular meshwork. And... Now, there are many classifications for primary angle closure disease. What we follow is the International Society of Geographical and Epidemiologic Ophthalmic Society where angle closure is classified as suspect or primary angle closure or primary angle closure glaucoma based on five parameters, iridotrabecular contact, presence of peripheral eye anterior sinecae, presence of elevated IOP, uh, disc changes and visual field changes. Primary angle closure suspect is one where the angle is at risk with more than 270 degree of iridotrabecular contact which we elucidate on gonioscopy. There are absence of perif peripheral anterior sinecae and such patients will have normal IOP, a normal optic disc and normal visual fields on examination. Here, this is an ultrasound biomicroscopy of patients where on the left side, the figure A shows an open angle the, between the cornea and iris, whereas on the figure B and C show how the iris comes in contact with the cornea at the trabecular meshwork interface and occludes the trabecular meshwork. This closure might be appositional or synechial and cause rise in IOP or an angle closure which may precipitate an attack. Primary angle closure are those patients where there is more than 270 degree of iridotrabecular contact there is an elevated IOP and peripheral anterior sinecae may or may not be present. So even these patients will have a normal disc and normal visual field. 
The more threatening is the primary angle closure glaucoma, where there is all the features are present with more than 270 degrees of iridotrabicular contact. Such patients will have characteristic elevated IOP, characteristics optic disc changes, and visual field changes. Now, this is a basically a natural history of angle closure disease where primary angle closure suspect progress to primary angle closure and gradually to primary angle closure glaucoma. So early identification again plays an important role. The older clinical classifications used uh, the clinical presentation and symptomatology to classify angle closure disease where latent were those patients who were primary angle closure suspect they were largely asymptomatic and used to be detected only on gonioscopy with occludable angles. The figure shows Van Herrick's grading with a very narrow angle. The subacute were those with intermittent closure. Intermittent episodes resulted in chronic uh, a sudden onset of IOP elevation, but recurrent episodes of headache and they were relieved by some form of rest. These episodes are generally self-limiting and again on uh, gonioscopy on routine screening, they might have peripheral anterior sinicae and ampositional angle closure. What is more threatening to us is acute angle closure because such patients with latent and intermittent episodes may uh, land up into acute angle closure where there is sudden onset of IOP elevation with severe unilateral headache, redness of the eye, watering, perspiration, photophobia, and such patients generally may complain of halos with nausea and vomiting. Such an acute attack may be so severe to cause conjunctival hyperemia, hazy and cornea, decreased visual acuity, a mid-dilated pupil, and it can be severe enough to cause even bradycardia and arrhythmia. Hence, a diagnosis of acute angle closure whenever made is a medical emergency. Also, there is a chronic form of angle closure in which there is an asymptomatic elevation of IOP or peripheral anterior sinicae and these patients will have disc and visual field pain changes and they will behave like open angle glaucoma. So basically, we need to identify those who can go into an acute attack of glaucoma. In our routine clinical setup, we use Van Herrick examination which is used worldwide. It is a very simple and valuable tool for angle closure screening used at the side of the patient using slit lamp where peripheral anterior sinicae Peripheral anterior chamber depth is compared with peripheral corneal thickness. The angle is may be occludable if peripheral anterior chamber depth is more less than one fourth of the corneal thickness. Coming to gonioscopy, which we routinely do as part of our comprehensive eye examination, it is the gold standard for angle assessment, and we use both two mirror and four mirror lenses. Various grading schemes have been devised to assess the angle and grade them accordingly, and and record our gonioscopic findings. This is the figure of how an open angle looks on gonioscopy. Five structures are visualized which we see on gonioscopy from anterior to posterior. We see the Schwalbe's line, non-pigmented trabecular meshwork, the pigmented trabecular meshwork which is the main functional site of uh, the drainage of aqueous humor, scleral spur and ciliary body band. Here we show a short video of indentation gonioscopy which we have recorded using our uh, slit lamp photography. There is uh, initially on this the this shows on indentation how the angle structures open up and shows the posterior trabecular meshwork. So basically, indentation gonioscopy helps us to identify appositional and synical angle closure. The synical angle closure will not open on indentation, whereas appositional angle closure will open on indentation. Another short video of indentation gonioscopy. Again, the angle the structures are not visible, but on deep indentation, the angle open up freely to allow access of aqueous humor. Indentation, these figures show indentation gonioscopy of the inferior angles. Now, occludable angles are identified again on gonioscopy, where the posterior pigmented trabecular meshwork, which is the main functional site, is not visible in more than 270 degree of angle. Other ancillaries which we have in our department is ultrasound biomicroscopy, which is a dynamic, high-resolution imaging of anterior segment structures. We can see the anterior chamber angle, the iris, iris lens interaction, and ciliary body. It helps us elucidate any underlying mechanisms of angle closure in most cases and in doubtful cases. The advantage of this is that we can also scan behind the iris. In our department, we also have anterior segment OCT, 
which is a high speed imaging of anterior segment structures which does not require contact with the patient eye. It may be superior to gonioscopy in detecting angle occludability, allows for quantitative anterior chamber angle measurement and detection of narrow angle. The advantage is that it has a way better resolution, can even be performed in the immediate post-op period, gives us a limbus to limbus view and complements gonioscopic finding, allowing us a faster speed and 360 degree imaging of the cornea. The figure on the right shows anterior segment OCD. Figure A shows an open angle, where we can see the iridotrabule. This is the iris and this is the corneal interface. This is the angle. Now, gradually, this iris is coming in contact in figure B with the trabecular meshwork site and might cause angle closure. In figure C, there is definite. This shows definite closure of the angle structures. Now, we assess various parameters like angle recess area, trabecular iris space area, iris configuration, cupillary block, iridotrabecular apposition, and lens vault. The disadvantages are that it has limited use in opaque media, structures behind the iris is not visualized, visualized and less penetration, so we can use anterior segment OCT and both ultrasound biomicroscopy interchangeably. Mechanism of primary angle closure glaucoma, the main mechanism is relative pupillary block. A normal patient having a normal angle structures, here there is a midriasis, any form of midriasis causes dilatation of the pupil, the iris lens diaphragm moves forwards and causes apposition between the iris and the lens. There's a relative pupillary block. It's not absolute, it's a relative pupillary block wherein aqueous collects in the posterior chamber, pushing the iris forward. Iris bomb and appositional angle closure causes rise in IOP. Several such episodes can lead to formation of peripheral anterior sinaceae. Coming to phacogenic glaucoma, we encounter many a times when the cataract is left largely un un unattended and ignored. You can find such for patients with dense white cataracts and phacogenic glaucomas are those where phacomorphic glaucoma has a thick lens, phacotopic glaucoma where there can be an anteriorly positioned lens or a sublux lens can cause closure of the angle space. Coming to the risk factors, age is a very important risk factor. A PACG is much more common in people older than 60 years of age. A definite family history, the first degree relatives are more prone because ocular anatomic structure features are largely inherited. Female gender and patients with hypermetropia. So anyone wearing plus glasses has high tendency towards angle closure glaucoma. Now, there are certain ocular risk factors which we routinely assess in our department where there is a shallow anterior chamber and decreased anterior chamber volume. It has been found that eyes with acute angle closure have shallow anterior chamber depth compared to eyes without angle closure. Short axial length, which we assess on A scan and uh, biometry, where shorter axial length translates into more hyperopic refraction, that is more the incidence of hypermetropia. Again, a smaller corneal diameter which we measure digitally also in our department. A uh, smaller diameter of cornea predisposes to crowded anterior chamber angle with high risk of angle closure and also increased posterior corneal curvature. We have lens uh, IOL master 700 which, with which, which we can assess uh, the uh, posterior corneal curvature also. On the same machine, we, have, we can assess the increased thickness of lens and anterior insertion of iris into ciliary body. Groups which are more susceptible to angle closure have thicker lenses. Lens thickness, as we know, increases with age. And hence, the increased lens thickness may be an important explanation for progressive shallowing of anterior chamber and increased prevalence of PACG observed in older age group. Other ocular risk factors are decreased corneal height and anterior position of lens and increased core curvature of lens, which we can assess both on uh, ultrasound microscopy and ASOCT. Now, to remember the triggers for precipitating an attack, any form of emotional upset. Emotional upset triggers midriasis due to increased sympathetic tone and cause relative pupillary block. Any form of bad news, pain, intense excruciating pain, fear or illness may precipitate an attack of angle closure. Similarly, when we are in some form of dim illumination or when like the weathers are on extreme ends and Under dim illumination, again, there is midriasis, which causes precipitation of an acute attack. 
forward movement of lens we have not we have largely ignored this fact that during reading some patients might complain of headache during reading which might get relieved on rest on change in body position such as this figure highlights myotic therapy and then there are pharmacological triggers for precipitating an attack such as anticholinergic agents both topical and systemic such as antihistamines antidepressants anti parkinsonian drugs and gi spasmolytics and adrenergic agents can trigger midriasis which we use as topical and both systemic systemic include vasoconstrictors cns stimulants bronchodilators appetite suppressant and hallucinogen hallucinogenic drugs so while making a prescription we need to keep in mind if a patient is developing any symptoms or not of an acute angle closure now i will hand over the management of primary angle closure disease to my senior resident dr ankita eshwarya ma'am so I'll be discussing about the management part of the primary angle closure disease. But before we proceed for this, we need to know a few things. Okay, so the first thing, whether all occludable angles progress to primary angle closure glaucoma? Well, certainly no. As per a study done by Thomas R. Ethel, they found that only 22% of the eyes, they progress to primary angle closure and only 28% of primary angle closure, they progress to primary angle closure glaucoma. There are few provocative tests which are being included and done for primary angle closure suspect cases. These are basically done to find out whether these patients are at higher risk to progress to primary angle closure glaucoma. These tests are not done in those patients who already have an established primary angle closure glaucoma. So uh, one of them is a dark room prone test. As you can see in the background, the room is darkened and the patient is asked to sit over the chair with hand lying over the table and patient's head lying over it. After 30, 60 minutes, the intraocular pressure is checked. Now, what, what happens with this? Once you're asking the patient to sit down like this with head in the uh, prone, po uh, prone position, the lens shifts anteriorly. So after 60 minutes, we'll uh, again uh, look at the IOP. We measure the IOP. And if the IOP is more than 8 millimeter of mercury from the baseline, then it is considered to be positive. If it is 6 to 7 millimeter higher, then it is considered to be a borderline. And if it is five or less, then it is considered to be a negative. Now the next thing is, do all eyes with primary angle closure suspect need laser eye dotomy? Well, no, not all cases are needed, but only provided if the follow-up can be maintained. Laser PI would definitely be recommended in the patients who have established primary angle closure or primary angle closure glaucoma in the fellow eye. If there is a family history of primary angle closure, those patients who cannot come for the regular follow-up Patients who require frequent uh, pupillary dilation, like patients with type 2 retinopathy or a hypertensive retinopathy, or those with uh, uh, intraocular tumors, and those patients who are found positive on the provocation test. Uh, coming to the first I, uh, uh, entity, the primary angle closure or subacute or intermittent angle closure. Just, I'd like to uh, make you understand what does this intermittent angle closure mean? If you can see on your right side, there are two pictures of UBM ultrasound by microscopy. This is the right eye of the same patient. This is the left eye of the same patient. Now, whenever, uh, okay, as explained already by Dr. Divya, that this is the iris, this is the cornea. This area is called as the angle. So whenever the patient have an attack of iridocorneal apposition, so the angle reduces. If you see in the right eye, the angle is reduced. But however, in the left eye, what happens? The angle is completely opposed. Once the angle is completely opposed, what happens? That the aqueous outflow is obstructed. And hence, what happens subsequently? The intraocular pressure rises. Now, this is the main feature that these patients have recurrent attacks of idocorneal apposition, which results in high intraocular pressure. The problem lies that these recurrent episodes that leads to structural changes in the angles. Now, these patients, you know, they generally come to us, they'll say that they are having recurrent headache or pain over the eyeballs may or may not be associated with redness. But most importantly, it gets relieved by rest or even after sometimes spontaneously. These are also those patients, you know, who goes to movie theaters. Even most of us would have also experienced that thing. That when we go to the theater inside that dark room, we feel that, okay, it's not easy. There is heaviness is there. But once we are out, we feel that, okay, now the headache is relieved. The major problem is in the identification of these cases. Because when they present to us, mostly they don't have a high... Uh, I, IOP, neither there is a cup disc ratio changes are there or the glaucomatous changes are not there. The only way to identify these patients is by a gonioscopy. Unfortunately, gonioscopy is not so routinely performed everywhere for all the cases, so it's very difficult to identify them. 
However, whenever a, this case is present, then definitely laser PI is recommended. And if PAC is present with high IOP, then they can also be treated with the medical therapy. Coming on to the second entity, acute primary angle closure glaucoma. Now, these are uncommon compared to chronic primary angle closure glaucoma. Now, as the name suggests, acute. So these patients, they present to us with a sudden onset of pain. They'll come to us that, doctor, we are having a very severe pain lasting from last half an hour or one or two hour max, having severe redness, watering, glare, and colored halos. They can have even associated with the systemic manifestation of nausea, vomiting, and sweating because of the muscarinic effect. They have pain in the trisomeral distribution. Now, that's the one of the differentiating features. They can involve either V1, V2, V3. So these patients can have pain in the eye, in the orbit, in the head, in the sinuses, in the teeth, anywhere. And they're mostly unilateral. And which, when we check the intraocular pressure, it's mostly more than 40 millimeter of mercury. And this is how they present to us. You can see there is a circumciliary congestion all around. You can see there is a corneal haze due to corneal edema. And if you focus at this area, there are two microcysts, which is which you can see clearly, I think, on the picture. Now, these microcysts are the reason that why, you know, these patients come up with the colored halos. So they'll say that when we look at the bulb or the light, we can see rainbow around it. The pupil is mid-dilated and antichamber chamber reaction is also there. Coming on to the treatment part of acute primary angle closure. Well, it's an ocular emergency, and we need to immediately ASAP, you know, lower the intraocular pressure either by using mannitol or using syrup glycerol, depending upon the diabetic status. Apart from that, oral uh, as well as topical anti-glaucoma medications are also given to them. Laser treatment for acute primary angle closure. Well, NDEARG laser idotomy is a definite treatment in the involved eye as well as prophylactic in the fellow eye. What does it do? It basically relieves the attack and it also prevents the future attacks of the angle closure. Something very important. Whenever we are looking at one eye of the primary angle closure patients, we should not forget the other eye. Why? Because nearly 50% of the eyes, they go to an attack within the first month if prophylactic laser idotomy is not done. So it's very important. And second thing, follow-up. Because there is always a risk of chronic primary angle closure glaucoma, so follow-up should be maintained six monthly or yearly. Coming to the next entity, chronic primary angle closure glaucoma. Well, these are generally asymptomatic patients. They behave like an open angle glaucoma. We need to treat them aggressively once the optic neuropathy ensures as the progression of primary angle closure glaucoma is faster than the open angle glaucoma. They're treated mainly with the anti-glaucoma drugs, laser iodotomy. They prevent the future uh, further closure of the angle. Laser iodotomy, as you can see in the pictures, at around 2.30 o'clock, this is the, how the laser iodotomy looks like. I won't be going into the method on how we do this, but we need to know about the complications of this laser PI. Since it enters the first layer cornea, so they can have a corneal endothelial burns if the power is more. They can they hit directly over the crypt of the iris, so iris hemorrhage can occur if, again, the power is more. However, if the hemorrhage is small, then if we apply a gentle pressure, then it sp stops spontaneously. Intraocular spike can be there. Antichamber inflammation along with the closure of idotomy or formation of posterior sinica can be there. Even cataract can be formed if the lens is hit. Endothelial decompensation, malignant glaucoma, retinal damage, and even cystoid macular edema are reported cases if the, it is not done correctly. For the post-laser uh, uh, peripheral idotomy, we basically target upon, you know, to control the IOP spike and to control the inflammation. Coming on to surgical management of primary angle closure glaucoma. Most of the patients need trabeculectomy to control intraocular pressure. As you can see, this is the post-op day one picture of a patient who underwent trabeculectomy. This is a filtering bleb. Now, what does this do? This allows the aqueous humor to, uh, to uh, pass from the slim canal to the subconjunctival space. This is maintaining the intraocular pressure. However, in cases where, you know, the trabeculectomy is failed or it doesn't work or in non-calcitrant uh, glaucoma or in glaucoma, which are, you know, neo, uh, neovascular or uveitic glaucoma, the glaucoma drainage devices have also been come up. And uh, we, uh, what we use here is the amut glaucoma valve we use for uh, in these cases. However, if patients who have cataract, then definitely cataract extraction will widen the anterior chamber angle and it will lower the intraocular pressure too. Coming to something which is upcoming one is the role of lens, clear lens extraction. Now, what does this mean? Basically, what we are doing in this, we are removing the clear lens, means a lens which does not have a cataract, and we are placing a posterior chamber intraocular lens over it. Now, it is indicated if the lens is thickened or if it is anteriorly positioned. 
as you can see in the slit lamp first picture, this is slit lamp picture, which is showing that the angle is very narrow. This is the anterior segment OCT picture of the same patient. You can see how the lens is thicken and it is anteriorly, uh, anteriorly positioned that the iris is pushed anteriorly, causing a narrowing of the angle. Once the lens has been extracted, you can just compare how the, you know, the anterior chamber depth has been increased from one is grade one to grade four, it has increased. And also the angle is well maintained. Now the problem is that we generally we avoid in the younger patient because there are chances that they might have they will have loss of accommodation. Also, there's a risk of rare but possible side threatening complications are still documented. And removal is basically recommended when there are cataract stages present. So uh, there was an eagle study was done, which was a randomized trial for early lens extraction in primary angle closure or primary angle closure disease. It was a multicentric study which was done over the five countries. And they showed that uh, uh, greater efficacy and cost effectiveness of the clear lens extraction as compared to the standard care involving the laser iodotomy. The study showed us that uh, uh, there was reduced need of further glaucoma surgeries in these patients. And also these patients, they uh, needed uh, lesser number of uh, anti-glaucoma drugs compared to the those with laser iodotomy group where 60 patients of the patient needed anti-glaucoma medication despite undergoing laser iodotomy. So this was, uh, as per them, uh, definitely clear lens extraction is a good procedure. So that's all from my side. I'll request Dr. Vavasa to continue. Thank you for your patient listening. I will be covering our experience with early phaco emulsification in patients with acute primary angle closure. So current standard treatment is laser peripheral iodotomy. When the patients come with the acute primary angle closure, we immediately lower down the intraocular pressure by giving him by giving them mannitol or syrup cholesterol and all anti-glaucoma medication. So after uh, controlling the attack, we will do the laser peripheral iodotomy in all cases. But sometimes it is very difficult to perform because of thickened iris. The pupil is mid dilated. The pilocarpin doesn't work in these patients. And there is a lot of inflammation while doing laser peripheral iodotomy because of pigment shading occurs. And also there is more energy required. So chances of corneal burn are also there while doing laser peripheral iodotomy in an acute attack. And also the development of cataract process get enhanced by doing laser peripheral iodotomy in these patients. So there is another option of surgical peripheral iodectomy. So this is an option when we are unable to do the laser peripheral iodotomy. Generally, it is less preferred because of it is an invasive procedure. And also some of the studies has uh, quoted that it is associated, associated with multiple surgical re-intervention so it is less preferred generally surgical pain. So there are certain uh, randomized control trials for FACO versus laser peripheral iodotomy in acute primary angle closure cases. So they have shown that uh, the patients who are undergoing primary FACO emulsification have better intraocular pressure control and fewer anti-glaucoma medications were needed post-op. Patient would have a deeper anterior chamber and improve visual equity. Now, uh, there is another report from American Academy of Ophthalmology. So the, uh, it was based on the four studies of acute PACG and 119 patients. So they have also showed that the pri primary phaco emulsification is having better control of IOP in patients with acute primary angle closure trachoma. Now, how safe is lens extraction? Definitely, it is very challenging task because uh, anterior chamber is relatively shallower or flat. So absolute excess is the most difficult part in these eyes. Also, there are certain complications like chances of desmet membrane detachment. Pupil is uh, poorly dilating. Pre-op mannitol and medical control of intraocular pressure is must before attempting these patients for surgery. And also, there are chances of posterior capsular tear. There are certain few surgical tips to avoid these complications. Like, uh, first of all, surgical expertise is needed before attempting this, these cases in acute primary angle closure. Ample use of high-density viscosurgical devices is must, and use of pre-op pre -op mannitol is must unless it is contraindicated. Now, uh, this is current standard treatment versus proposed treatment in our study. So we have evaluated uh, efficacy and safety of primary phaco emulsification in acute primary angle closure cases. So we have, uh, it was a non-comparative study we just enrolled uh, patients over the 40 years of age or more 
and the acute primary angle closure was diagnosed on the basis of clinical features like periocular pain, blurred vision, colored halos, nausea and vomiting, ocular signs like conjunctival congestion, corneal haze, corneal edema, and elevated intraocular pressure more than 21 millimeter of mercury. Patients were having occludable angles. Most of the time, we are not able to see the angles. Uh, posterior trabecular meshwork over the angle. Uh, our outcome measures were best corrected visual acuity, intraocular pressure, number of quadrant in which the posterior trabecular meshwork was visible on the gonioscopy, number of anti glaucoma medications were also assessed. Patients were followed up over the one week, one month, and three months. So, this is the data of uh, 14 subjects. Uh, we can see, see here that mean intraocular pressure is around 38 millimeter of mercury, which is quite high. Number of anti glaucoma medications are 4.2, which is also very high. And uh, almost uh, 0.13 was the mean in which the number of quadrant we would able to see the posterior trabecular mesh. Uh, we, we can see here the IOP trend after the surgery which was mean 38 millimeter mercury, it has come down up to the 17.2 millimeter of mercury after the surgery. Uh, this is the table showing the best corrected visual acuity has definitely improved from 0.14 to 0. This is in the logmar uh, value. Intraocular pressure has come down from 38 to 17 millimeter of mercury. And number of quadrant in which the, we were able to see the posterior trabecular meshwork has increased up to the 3. And number of anti glaucoma medications were 4.2 preoperatively, which is just 0 0.4 after three months of surgery. These are few studies which have been done in these cases, and they have also shown that primary FACO emulsification is an effective procedure in these cases. There are certain complications. One patient experienced desmond membrane detachment in our study, but it got resolved with the intracameral air bubble injection. No other significant complication was noticed. So coming to discussion, we report the significant improvement of best corrected visual acuity, well-controlled intraocular pressure, reduction in the number of anti-glaucoma medications, and also the number of uh, quadrant in which we were able to see the posterior trabecular meshwork have increased. So surgery should be performed under cover of preoperative mannitol before the dilatation of pupil. And FACO emulsification should be done using the high density viscoelastic material. Now, our conclusion was early FACO emulsification appears as an effective option for medically controlled acute angle closure attacks associated with cataracts. We are, we are planning a randomized, one randomized control trial in these patients, uh, enrolling uh, more patients we will compare laser peripheral iodotomy with the primary phaco emulsification in these patients. Thank you so much.